There has been a battle that existed long before the Da Vinci Code. It has been a battle between two religious worldviews, the Eastern and the Western. The Eastern worldview holds that there is an impersonal force in the world. The belief is that all reality is held in a circle. We are all one, and one is all a part of creation. We are a part of each other. We are a part of God. We are God. This is pantheism and monism, the foundation of paganism, Wicca, mysticism, and Eastern religions. They all hold to a concept of an impersonal deity. The other worldview is exactly the opposite. It's biblical Christianity. It's the belief that we are a part of a creation that is separate from an infinite and personal God. This God is known through his creation and his intervention into mankind through history. Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code states that these fingerprints of God through history are fake. That Christianity's belief in the divine Jesus Christ is a hoax. Is Jesus divine? Or Da Vinci? As I travel around the country, I teach about the subject of the integrity of the New Testament uh, documents and the historical reliability of those documents. And recently in my teaching, I have people come up to me and say, but what about the Da Vinci Code? They don't seem to agree with what you're teaching. So I became compelled, I guess, to have to look into the matter for myself and to check out the records. It is about two characters. Somebody has uh, died. Um, Langdon, is that Langdon? Langdon. Yeah. A heralded American, um, I think he's a semiologist. They're trying to locate the Holy Grail, I believe. The Holy Grail is a, is a female, not an actual object, a cup or a chalice of any sort. So. Of course, there are the bad guys and uh, the murder, stuff like that. So it was a thriller. They go through this large chase, basically, of hunting down all these different clues. What was it? Priory Scion, I think it was. They, um, yeah, they had a, they were a protectorate of of the chalice, but I didn't think, and, and Da Vinci was a member of that. Da Vinci was one of the people that found out, like, supposedly in the book, the truth about what had happened, and he was... actually believed that Christ was married to Mary Magdalene, and um, if you see the picture of the Last Supper, um, everybody there, um, you know, during the Last Supper, there's one person, there's one person without a beard, and that's supposed to be Mary Magdalene. That relationship was you know, downplayed by the church over the centuries. And whether or not the church has been covering it up and just all the historical things that happened along the way with that. He has a page that he simply entitles Fact. And in there, he makes some claims about fact. And among those is the claim all descriptions of artwork, architecture, documents, and secret rituals in this novel are accurate. Documents I was particularly interested in because that's what I specialize in, the ancient documents. And there are some very, very strong allegations about the documents of the New Testament, especially the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And and people are being led astray. They're being, well, it's history, it's fact, Dan Brown says. He says, whenever I allude to history, I'm uh, writing accurately. In fact, Dan Brown, the author, said he is so confident of the reliability of the facts that he puts into this book that if he were to write a nonfiction account, he wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> now, the trouble is, the things he says in here, and the things that I have found in history, are not the same.
One of the facts that Dan Brown puts right on page one is in regard to a secret society he says existed since 1099 AD called the Priory of Sion. He maintains that a cache of documents were found in which prove the, 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 the society's role to guard an important secret. <laughs> that secret is Jesus' marriage to Mary Magdalene. And this was uh, protected by the church from getting out, and he has discovered the evidence that it's all true. Unfortunately for him, the documents he's talking about were actually planted in the library they know the name of the person, they know when it was done, and has acknowledged and admitted that that was the case. They are a hoax. They're not really historical documents at all. This is the kind of fact that Dan Brown uses. A second item that he says in his fact page, all the documents are historically reliable, that he quotes. But we find in his development of this theme uh, he has one of the characters by the name of Tebing tell another character by the name of uh, Sophie, uh, do you know the Da Vinci's views on the New Testament? And she says, no. And so he quotes from Da Vinci's notebook on polemics and speculation. And he says, many have made a trade of delusions and false miracles, deceiving the stupid multitude. And then he quotes from another one of Leonardo's writings, Blinding ignorance does mislead us. Oh, wretched mortals, open your eyes. And then he has the storyline develop. Sophie felt a little chill. Da Vinci is talking about the Bible? T. Bing nodded in agreement. When you look up these two quotes, what you find out in context, neither one of them have anything to do with the New Testament. And secondly, the second quote isn't even from the source that he identifies here in the book. So much for the confidence in his historical reliability. The Gnostic Gospels were written two to three to four hundred years after the fact. These were people that were not witnesses to the actual ministry of Jesus. They should be studied and understood um, as representations of the community of faith at that time. I think, they're I think they're apples and oranges. They were something that wasn't included in, in the Bible. The reason I find it more accurate that they would try and hide that uh, anything that could have possibly have been written at that time is because the way that Dan Brown laid out, real story was repressed because it was written by the winners. And that was, you know, to him, sort of in general men. I think so even the Bible was written how many hundreds of years after and I think the Gnostic Gospels you know not, I'm not that familiar with them but it seems totally logical to me that if they were in any way inherent to the power structure at the time that they would be squashed and repressed and, and revealed later say is if Jesus was married I've got no problem with it I think it's a lovely thought Another position that Dan Brown takes through the characters in this novel is that the Gnostic Gospels are reliable. And then he pulls out the Gospel of Philip, one of the Gnostic Gospels, and he quotes it. And the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. And then he goes through and says, as any Aramaic scholar will tell you, the word companion in those days literally meant spouse. In other words, Mary is the wife of Jesus. What's wrong with this? Well, first of all, it's not in Aramaic. The Gospel of Philip was written in Greek, and what we have today is merely a Coptic translation of that Greek, no Aramaic. Nevertheless, even if it were Aramaic or Greek, Professor Craig Blumberg of Denver Seminary makes this statement, no Aramaic or Hebrew words for companion normally mean spouse. In other words, that's not reliable either. There are no documents 
known from ancient times that ever refer to Jesus and Mary being husband and wife. None. They're all a stretch, like the one about companion making it the spouse, when in fact, I don't think any scholars would agree. They would tend to say that's not really true. The number of errors, actually, that are found in the Da Vinci Code are, are so numerous that it would take another book to catalog them. But I, I have actually gone through and just identified a few of those that I could just cite to show the magnitude of the problem. He said there were trunks of documents found under Solomon's temple. No such documents or find has ever been documented. He says that the Dead Sea Scrolls are the earliest Christian writings, and he refers to the Gospels in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are 200, 100 years before Christianity, before Christ, and they contain no Gospels at all. He says the Merovingians founded Paris, when in fact historians will tell you that Paris was founded seven centuries before the Merovingians. This is what I mean. You can't stop when you start analyzing what he calls the factual background to this novel. That's why it's again dangerous. It's misleading people into sort of thinking that they should accept this when in fact it's not true. You know, more important than all of the historical errors that might be in Brown's book, there's something way more important, and that is what he says about the New Testament and what the facts really are that we could go to. I, I want to illustrate just for a moment, if I could. He says that the Bible as we know it today was collated by the pagan Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. And a little later he says, Constantine commissioned and financed a new Bible, which omitted those gospels that spoke of Christ's human traits and embellished those Gospels that made him godlike. The earlier Gospels were outlawed, gathered up, and burned. There's just so many things about this that you want to respond to because he refers to the fact that the earlier Gospels were the ones that were outlawed and burned. Uh, really, nothing could be further from the truth. Constantine is in the fourth century. We're talking about 200 to 300 years after we already have evidence for the New Testament documents of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. By the second century, 200 years before Constantine, we have a list called the Muratorium Canon. which already lists most of the New Testament books collected and canonized. Constantine comes a couple hundred years later. How could it be that he would have somehow brought together the canon and he was responsible for it? It's simply not true. We already have quotes of the New Testament by the end of the first century, beginning of the second century. And what I mean is quotes, say, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We have quotes of the Apostle Paul. We have a variety of them. This is called the Apostolic Fathers. And the in here, you have all the writings, late first century, early second century. Constantly, they're quoting from New Testament books, proving they must have been written earlier. Let me try to put it this way. Brown's claim that the manuscripts he's using, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, are the early manuscripts is exactly the opposite. They are the late ones. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the early ones. The battle between Christianity and false teachings of the Gnostic Gospels was dealt with early in church history. That is why these later Gospels were not a part of the canon of Scripture. But how can we know that the New Testament scriptures we have today are accurate and haven't been changed over time? If I have
have your confidence? I was wondering if I could borrow from someone a $20 bill. <laughs> okay, how about a 10? <laughs> Does anybody have a buck? <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Actually, yeah, 20 would be great. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, yeah, 20s are much better than ones. Uh, wow, what else you got in there? That's great. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to imagine if you were sitting in a similar situation as this. And, you know, you know a public gathering of a large group of people. And then someone were to walk up onto the platform and do something like this. Now let's say that you were, imagine this, let's say you're about to clap, uh, unlike you people. <laughs> and you realize that no one else is clapping. Instead of clapping, people begin to bow and worship this person. So you're a bit confused and you ask the person sitting next to you and you say, you know, what's, what's, what's going on here? What's this all about? And, and then they look at you as if they have hope in their eyes for the very first time in their lives. And they say, finally, someone to guide us, someone we can believe. It occurs to you that this person claims to be divine. Now I'm talking about a real person. A person who claims to be God and proves it by doing this. Sadly, this person has over 35 million followers. I've visited the location where this takes place three times. It's in Southeast Asia. And very sadly, he does simple tricks. It's not real. Thank you very much. False proof. Trick that many of you could with practice learn. If the proof for someone's claim is false, what makes the claim false? <laughs> you know, what, what makes Jesus any different? That's the question. <laughs> Shouldn't he be subject to the same criterion? Why does it matter? Why do we care? Because Christianity is a historical faith, basing its truth on the claim that we can know God exists because he came to earth physically as the man Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. In other words, if that's not true, then the very heart of Christianity is torn out and Christianity fails to be the unique religion that it is because of the claim of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This diagram illustrates what I mean. If we use the circle to represent God, we use the triangle to represent the physical world, we now say, how do we know if we're living in the triangle that there is a God out there somewhere? And the answer to Judaism with Moses, the answer to Islam with Muhammad is to say, because that God communicated with us, he communicated in a book, the Ten Commandments, or in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, or Muhammad would say with the Quran, and therefore we know that God does exist. But if you ask Christians, they would answer differently, I hope. And that is, they would use John's Gospel, chapter one, where they would say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and lived with us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, Moses and Muhammad claimed to be prophets of God. Jesus claimed to be God. 
And the historical truthfulness of that is, of course, embedded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the rest of the New Testament. Dan Brown goes straight at this and calls this fabrication and calls it in the novel that it simply is a legend, not true at all. And of course, that knocks the entire legs, pulls the rug out, if you would, out of the entire Christian faith. Now, the question becomes, if Dan Brown is right, then we should have courage enough to face it. But the fact is, the overwhelming evidence is available to us to know for a fact that Dan Brown is wrong. And But it's misleading many, many people out there who are not prepared to know why it's false and why it's wrong. The Da Vinci Code strikes at the heart of the Christian faith. As Dr. David Noble says, the historical Bible, which is the written word, and the Jesus Christ, the living word, are the two cornerstones of the Christian worldview. If you want to destroy Christianity, if you want to shatter Christian doctrine, simply shatter its historical underpinnings. And he's right. That's exactly why people who do not want Christianity to be true will oftentimes attack its historical foundation because it is a historical faith, and therefore those things have to be true. On what basis should the gospel stories about Jesus be considered true? Well, you make a choice. Which is correct? The stories are true because I believe them, that is, I have faith in them, or I believe the stories have faith in them because they are true. I answer the second one. I believe the stories because they are true. Regarding the New Testament, what is the truth concerning that? The first apostles of Jesus Christ knew the difference between fact and fiction. In their writings, they point out in 2 Peter 1.16, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, they said, we didn't make this stuff up. We know that that's legend. We know that that's fairy tale. No, we were there. We were eyewitnesses. That's what we are talking about, he said. Well, now, how do we know that the New Testament is reliable? First of all, how many manuscripts are there of the New Testament? Why do we care? Because the more ancient manuscripts that you find, the more capably you are of being able to come up with the more exact text of the original writers. Julius Caesar here wrote about 50 years before Jesus came uh, in 50 B.C. If you look at this timeline, you see there that Julius Caesar there is in 50 B.C., and then we don't have a printing press until the 15th century. All right, now how are you going to get it from Julius Caesar to the printing press? Well, you're going to have to have scribes, human copyists, who are going to take that document and copy it by hand for 1,400 years in order to get it to a printing press so we can get a printed form of it. But what is wrong with, the problem with this is that some people claim that during the hand copying period of time, those centuries, they get changed. They get revised. Legends creep into the text. And that's exactly what they're going to claim here for the New Testament as well. In terms of number of manuscripts during the time from the original authorship to the printing press, that period of time, how many different manuscripts have been found? You see on the chart here that you have the most is Homer's Iliad, 643. But you have also Caesar, which is the one I was referring to. You only have 10 manuscripts that have ever been found. Yes, that's true. From 50 B.C., all the way to the printing press over 1,400 years later, only 10 manuscripts have ever been found of Julius Caesar's work, The Gaelic Wars. Some are more, some are less, but most of them are down in the same ballpark as 10 or less, 20 or less. Very few ever get over 100. Therefore, what about the New Testament? How does it compare with this range of ancient literature. You might want to hang on to your chair uh, a little bit here so you don't uh, get too alarmed. The New Testament is not in the same league as all the other literature. There are over 24,600 manuscripts of the New Testament that have been found, over 5,600 of them in the original Greek language. 
over 8,000 in Latin and a host of other languages. The next closest of any ancient literature is 643, Homer's Iliad, and that's considered to be extremely unusual. What would 24,600 be? In other words, the New Testament is the best of all known ancient literature in the number of manuscripts. And you might want to know here, why don't we just go back to the original? Why don't we go back to the original New Testament? Why don't we go back to the original Julius Caesar? It's authored copy because we don't have it. We don't have any originals of anything of ancient times. All we have are copies. So the concern and question is, how good are the copies? And do they represent what the original authors wrote? Therefore, in any university, they will do literary, literary studies, and in those literary studies, they will say how many manuscripts have been found of the work in question, how early are the manuscripts, how accurately have they been copied. That's the way you test it in secular literary analysis. That's what we're doing here, and we'll find the New Testament comes out head and shoulders above everything else. So, what about the earliness of the manuscripts? That is, how close to the author can we find copies? The, the consensus of scholars is that the further you get removed down those centuries from the author, the more likely it is that you will have accumulation of error due to copying and the intrusion of, inter, of extra information or the extraction of information. Therefore, it, is less in, it has less integrity because of those changes. Julius Caesar wrote his original in 50 BC. We don't have the original. Where do we go to find the first known manuscript? 950 years later in the 9th century. In between the name Julius Caesar and that arrow, there's absolutely no indication of Julius Caesar's work ever been found. That's enough time for some changes to have crept into the text. What about one of the works of Aristotle? Writing perhaps in the 5th century BC, we don't have a, a manuscript until 1000 AD. It was copied for over 1400 years without a trace ever being left. Why are we not questioning those works? Virgil, writing about the same time as Julius Caesar, we do have a manuscript within about 350 years. But notice no manuscript, no, no work of ancient times has manuscripts that have been found within the eyewitness generation of the author himself. There's always a gap in the span of time in there. What about the New Testament? Jesus' death and resurrection was about 30 AD. If we're going to have these writings, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, be writings of integrity, we're going to have them written during the eyewitness generation. By the time we hit 100 AD, we're very likely to have everyone dead who knew Jesus. Therefore, they would have to have been written by that time. What the Da Vinci Code says is that they were not written until you get down here in the late second and in the third century. And it's down there in that time frame that you get legends that have developed. In fact, there are numerous Gospels that come from that time period and later that contain lots and lots of legends. They're called the New Testament Apocrypha, false writings, those which contain legends not to be relied upon, not to be trusted. Is that what the New Testament is? Is it written down there as well? If that were so, of course, Matthew couldn't have written Matthew's gospel. He'd have been dead a hundred years before that. Therefore, somebody else must have written it in Matthew's name. John didn't write the gospel of John. Someone else would have had to write it in John's name, if that's true. Let me give you two reasons why I know that that's not true. That they did not write them down in that time frame, but rather within the eyewitness generation. This book does an analysis of what is called the Apostolic Fathers. The Apostolic Fathers are the first generation following the New Testament apostles. The apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus. These people who wrote were not, but they learned about Jesus and were taught by those who were eyewitnesses, the apostles themselves, of, of whether it be John or whether it be Peter or Paul or whatever. And so what he did, uh, this author went through and then analyzed these writings that come from late in the first century and in the early part of the second century. And we find Polycarp, who at that time was the Bishop of Smyrna, 
about 110, he writes, and he refers to 18 of the New Testament letters. Now, you could probably figure this out quite nicely. If by 110, 18 of the New Testament letters, including Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are being quoted in the secondary literature, they must have already been written. You can't quote what doesn't exist. In AD 108, Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, quotes 24 of the New Testament letters. There are only 27. Therefore, almost all of them are quoted in secondary literature by 108 AD. And then finally, even earlier, Clement of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, by 96, quotes 11 of the New Testament letters, including Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Therefore, we would conclude that by 95 AD, still within the eyewitness generation, we have 25 of the 27 New Testament letters being cited in secondary literature, proving they couldn't have been written late in the second century, but they had to have been written late or mid first century. There's one more point I said I would have. Time Magazine published this issue at Easter 1996. And at that time, it cited that there were three fragments of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which have some controversy associated with them in terms of the exact date that they were written. But nevertheless, they pointed out that they are earlier than any other manuscripts of the New Testament that have ever been found. Dr. Christian Peter Thede dates this portion of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, to about 60 A.D., Jesus was crucified and resurrected about 30, so we're within 30 years of Jesus. And someone clearly could have been alive who would have known Jesus and could have written down what he said and what he did. Therefore, we have manuscripts that are showing up within the eyewitness generation of Jesus himself. And as a result, we can demonstrate conclusively that what the Da Vinci Code says that the New Testament was written late in the 2nd or 3rd century. It was a late Christian writing, is again false, as many other things that we have been demonstrating in the Da Vinci Code. Jesus stated in the upper room that further truth would be revealed only through the eyewitness apostles. In other words, he told them the night he was uh, was arrested and the next uh, uh, day crucified that he would reveal further truth to those who were in the upper room, the apostles, and that's what the church understood. As soon as the apostles are dead, by the end of the first century, the church closed the canon and said there are no more writing for the New Testament because we only accept what Jesus said in the upper room. It must be by eyewitnesses. And that's exactly what we have. Eyewitness accounts of the teachings of Jesus. Now, what does the Da Vinci Code do? The Da Vinci Code takes the Nag Hammadi uh, discovery in Egypt, and uh, which, in which it found some Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, or maybe the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip. There are others, the Gospel of Truth, uh, the Gospel of Judas, a variety of Gospels. Now, in this particular case, they are put into the New Testament Apocrypha, which is not included in our Bibles, because they are considered legends not historical truth. They have considerable amount of suspect that they have accrued, like Dan Brown says about the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have accrued material that is merely imaginative. It has nothing to do with historical fact. Why, if if you look at these, you understand, Mary was dead over 100 years before that was written. It was written pseudonymously. That is, someone wrote it with her name in order to give it credibility. Same thing with Thomas and Philip. They were dead long before this was ever written, but it was used in their name to give them credibility. Those are the Gospels that Dan Brown uses in the Da Vinci Code, while rejecting Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because he says they're not reliable. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can prove, are the eyewitnesses of Jesus, The ones Dan Brown uses are the legends. Therefore, he has simply repositioned Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for his convenience so that he can make statements about marriage of Jesus and Mary and a variety of other things and can pass it off as authoritative.
and factual. Jesus divine or Da Vinci? If the New Testament documents are reliable, then why do some people have a problem with the divinity of Jesus Christ? When I talk with people on the street, surprisingly, a large amount are struggling with this issue after reading the Da Vinci Code. Jesus declared himself to be the Son of God. He said that no one could come to God the Father but through him. On page 234, Da Vinci Code says, Constantine the, the emperor in the fourth century commissioned and financed a new Bible, which omitted those gospels that spoke of Christ's human traits and embellished those gospels that made him godlike. The earlier gospels were outlawed, gathered up, and burned. Well, there's lots of problems with that. By the end of the first century, we now have evidence that the New Testament writings were already written. By the middle of the second century, we have people being tried for heresy for trying to change them because they had already been finalized in use and practice. We're still 200 years away from Constantine at that point. It would be impossible for Constantine to have an influence on the selection of which books should be in the New Testament because that took place 200 years before he lived. And that's essentially what I am pointing out here for a century and a half. This has already been done. It's false. That's not correct. Any scholar will tell you that that's the case. Da Vinci Code says on page 231, the Bible was collated by the pagan Roman emperor Constantine. He says more than 80 Gospels were considered for the New Testament, yet only a few were chosen for inclusion. Dr. Craig Blomberg a professor of New Testament and apologetics at Denver Seminary, responds to this when he says, if we were to go in the first four centuries and try to find every gospel that archaeologists and others have ever found, including those that are only referenced in other writings, you haven't found an actual copy, but they're just referenced, he said the most he can come up with is 24 that have ever been in existence. Where does this 80 come from? It is historical revisionism. It's a novel. Had it stayed a novel, we could say, ha ha. But he says this is factual. It's not. The canon of the New Testament was established, used, and defended nearly two centuries before Constantine a panel, he says, of religious experts decided which books should be included. There was no panel. There are no records whatsoever that that ever took place. Eighty Gospels submitted. It never happened. The four biblical Gospels were recognized as eyewitness sources already in the first century. The Da Vinci Code continues to say that paganism gives women a real boost in terms of their own uh, worth and value. But they failed to point out that in the Gospel of Thomas, Simon Peter said, this is quoted from the Gospel of Thomas, one of the apocryphal writings, Simon Peter said, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus responded, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's liberating, isn't it, gals? <clears throat> no, it doesn't. Paganism will take you into bondage. And that's what's, that's what's reported here in the Da Vinci Code. Virtually everything, in a sense. It has the appearance of being well-researched. And it actually is. It has an incredible, incredible amount of research in it. It's just that that's the dangerous part. It's mixed in with all the false statements. So you never know when it's true and when it's not, unless you know the facts. Da Vinci Code says on page 235, almost everything our fathers taught us about Christ is false. Now that's a pretty big statement. That's a very broad statement. The facts of it, of course, are the New Testament 
has more integrity than any other ancient writing. The New Testament has been confirmed as historically reliable by archaeological discoveries, and the New Testament has been proved to be written within the eyewitness generation of Jesus himself. They have every reason to believe that they are indeed truthful. They have been confirmed by manuscripts, confirmed by archaeology, there are no more reliable sources anywhere in the world than we have for the New Testament. Once again, the Da Vinci Code is wrong. Da Vinci Code in 233 and 234 says, Constantine upgraded Jesus' status to deity almost four centuries after Jesus' death. Until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal Jesus himself in the Gospels, recorded by the eyewitnesses, claimed to be God. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. That's the name of God, the one who was at the burning bush. He says, that was me. I and the Father are one, calling himself equal with the Father. All the same attributes. That's why they picked up stones to stone him to death, because they considered that, of course, blasphemous. Not only did Jesus claim to be God, already in his lifetime, but his, the New Testament eyewitnesses, the apostles who were with him, also wrote in the New Testament that he was God. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thomas answered and said to him when he saw the nail prints in his hands, My Lord and my God. What do you mean? No one ever thought of Jesus as God prior to Constantine. And thirdly, of course, we have the apostolic fathers, the early church fathers. All the way through here, let me just give you some examples. Already by 70 to 79 in the Epistle of Barnabas, quotes Psalm 110 to prove that Jesus was the Messiah is also God. Ignatius in 110, by faith and love toward Jesus Christ our God. Justin Martyr in AD 150, being the first begotten word of God is even God. Irenaeus in 185, our Lord, our God, and Savior, and King. <laughs> what do we mean? No one ever thought of him as God until Constantine. He claimed to be God. The New Testament eyewitnesses claimed he was God, and the early church fathers all claimed he was God. Once again, it's very easy to demonstrate that it's a novel, it's fiction. It should have never been claimed to be anything else. Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. A relatively close vote at that. <clears throat> the debate at the Council of Nicaea was not about whether Jesus was divine or mortal. It was rather whether Jesus was co-eternal with the Father. Was he created or was he eternal? But there was no question. He was God. Close vote? Yeah, 316 to 2. <clears throat> that was the vote at the Council of Nicaea. And the only two dissenting votes of his eternal divinity were the two that brought the proposal that he was mortal and, and created, called the Arian Controversy. They were the only two who dissented on the vote. But in the Da Vinci Code, he barely made it. It's astonishing that a novel, which is riddled with demonstrable falsehoods, could be received with open arms as factual by so many in our society today. Um, what do you think, Jesus divine or da Vinci that Dan Brown tries to talk about? I think it's about? how Dan Brown wrote about him. I think Jesus was just a, you know, probably got arrested for something as simple as trespassing and that's why he got crucified. I don't think it was for this big, you know, set of religion that he brought down. I think he was probably an itinerant preacher, you know, I think he was carrying a bloodline. That's interesting to me too, but I feel like he wasn't divine. He was a man. Yeah, I would agree. I think he was more of a, a bloodline that he was, he was crucified for uh, fear of, you know, the, the powers that be at that time. I think that he was a good person, probably a great philosopher, um, but I don't necessarily believe in his divinity. I think he's divine. 
but I think a lot of people that read this might think he's Da Vinci and a lot of people probably some combination of the two. Is he divine or Da Vinci? Divine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I certainly don't feel that I'm qualified to answer it. I think Jesus is divine. Divine. We say Da Vinci. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Uh, wow. It would. It, it, it's. Uh, it's got to be somewhere in between. Jesus is divine. Uh, the Da Vinci Code is nothing more than than in fabrication and fiction. You know, a thought occurred to me that it's hard to fathom. It's actually, if I say it the way I really feel, it's frightening to realize how does a book like The Da Vinci Code that has demonstrable inaccuracies, exaggerations, how does it capture the minds of so many people who believe it's factual so quickly and so easily. I say frightening because a day is coming according to the prophetic New Testament scriptures in which there will be a deception brought to the earth that will be sort of the grandfather of all deceptions beyond anything that the Da Vinci Code could possibly do. And how will people stand? Where will they align with that? How easily will they be persuaded that this is true when in fact it is nothing but a deception? That causes me to encourage everyone to look at the facts, read the records of the New Testament, which are demonstrably early eyewitness quality, tested over the centuries, that you would not be among those who would be misled because the results may be disastrous for our lives. The Da Vinci Code is fiction. It's a novel. The New Testament has lasted for the past 2,000 years, declaring the divinity of Jesus Christ. Each person has to make that decision of who is Jesus for themselves. What do you choose?